Yay. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. It, it's it's kind of nice to know Renolda is, is we're not as big as y'all, but we're kind of the same, same kind of garden um, in that we have art and we have a historic grounds and a historic home. Um, uh, and as you said, you know, my talk is about drug abuse, get your lawn off drugs. And it's basically, um, I'm going to give you some tips and tell you why and all that other stuff that um, I hope will help make you guys safer in the gardening world. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about the gardens. I wasn't always in horticulture. I was actually a talent agent for stand-up comedians. Um, I handled people like Jeff Foxworthy um, and Brett Butler. And here we have some young guy. I can't remember his name. Um, Robin Williams. Um, he would come through uh, on his, when he would do HBO shows, and he was actually on Mork and Mindy when he, we took this picture. Um, but he would come, th the comedians would come through and try out their acts at the club. And if people laughed, then they would take it and, and put it on their uh, shows. Um, but I'm a big believer in following your passion. And I had always, always been into plants. Literally, I mean, seriously, from the day I was born, I loved plants. Um, of course, when I first got this license tag, sadly, from the DeKalb DMV, it was actually backwards, um, two implants. And I'm like, no, this is not what I ordered. And the last time I checked, I'm pretty sure they're mine. Um, so I had to take it back and it, uh, gosh, the, guy, and the same guy who gave me this, uh, gave me the two implants, was beet red. It was it was pretty funny. I did have a slide of that, but I can't find it anymore. So I don't know what happened in my move. But plants led me to my dream job of Smith Gilbert Gardens. And Smith Gilbert Gardens um, is an historic home. Um, it, 16 acres. And uh, it was originally owned by Hiram Butler. And he got his money in the railroad industry. And he owned huge tracts of land. Um, but in the 70s, Smith, uh, Smith and Gilbert bought the property um, and mainly because they were big birders, believe it or not. And we are located at the base of Kennesaw Mountain, uh, which is a migratory flight landmark for birds. So we get bird species through here that most people don't see in Georgia. But who were Smith Gilbert? Well, as I said, they were big birders. And so some of the first plants they planted were species for birds. Like we have a huge viburnum collection, a huge holly collection. And these pictures I just took this week. Um, and so the cedar wax wings are coming through and they're, in a, they're one of my favorite all time birds. I mean, literally the hollies are just heaving with them right now. Um, but they also were big art collectors and we have one of the largest outdoor uh, art collections um, for, for a small, for a garden our size. Um, and this year we planted 10,000 daffodil bulbs around all of our artwork to uh, create art in bloom. And I'm hoping it'll really be um, quite the display. But for me, of course, the plants are what is the artwork. And we have uh, one of the largest, and in my humble opinion, uh, one of the nicest uh, bonsai collections in the country. Um, so I hope you guys will come down and, and visit me and I'll show you around. Um, I'd like to show you just a, a four shots taken this to show you in every season, this garden is so beautiful. Um, this was uh, summertime, this is fall, winter, but really it's the springtime that this garden, as in most of our gardens, uh, is really spectacular time of year um, for us. As John said, we created a crevice garden. It's the first of its kind in Georgia. Um, what you're looking at are concrete blocks with plants planted in little tiny crevices. Um, and so we're able to grow plants that we can't typically grow here in the South, like really cool cactus, species bulbs, um, and it's, I always say, it's not the cold that kills the plants here, it's the wet. So this soil is incredibly fast draining. And this is just another uh, view from the crevice garden. But we at SGG are chemical free. Well, except recreationally. <laughs> we don't use chemicals except recreationally. No, I'm kidding. Um, we do not use chemicals. We don't use herbicides and we don't use pesticides. Um, 
I do have an army of volunteers that we get out there. And I mean, I don't have a manicure because I'm out there hand pulling weeds, but we weed and then we mulch. We weed and then we mulch. And that's what makes our garden so um, easy to maintain. Um, it wasn't always that way though. For, for many years, uh, the old director owned his own landscape company. And so he sprayed voraciously. Everything got sprayed, herbicide, pesticide. Um, and it was the day, I will tell you, that the gentleman who maintained our rose uh, collection showed up in a hazmat suit and an air respirator to spray fungicide on the roses. And he told me that we couldn't allow, which we had children in the garden, a school tour, we couldn't let them play in the rose garden because the fungicide is so toxic. So I had been here maybe, I don't know, three weeks when that happened and a bell went off in my head and I'm like, no, that's, that's not gonna happen. So the rose garden is now organic um, and I'm proud to say that the whole garden is, is basically organic. So we did it for them, but we also did it for them. Um, I just cannot tell you how enjoyable it is to see kids run and play on a lawn that is safe uh, for them. Um, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the butterflies in our exhibit. So butterflies have been making our planet interesting, more beautiful for over 50 million years. They are a successful insect, as delicate as they are. And they're the ambassadors of the insect world. So I consider butterflies like a gateway bug because people who are normally afraid of insects forget at the end of the day, they're just another bug. I mean, a really pretty one, but they're another bug. Um, so in 2016, we opened a garden with wings, butterflies and biodiversity. And we started with a hoop house, John, just, I, I mean, it was just, we tore it apart. It was actually, it was only about four feet high and you had a duck to go in. It was just really a storage area. So we raised it up by 10 feet. And then we put this uh, shade cloth on there that's super tiny hole so that predators couldn't get in there. And this was all done and all planted by our volunteers. And the most important thing, and this is key for the homeowner as well, that if you want pollinators in your garden, you have to provide um, a food source for the whole life cycle of that animal. So in the butterfly exhibit, you'll notice that that tree that she's kne kneeling over, it, this is a tulip poplar that I know they get like 80 feet tall, but we keep it pollard. But this is an important tree in, um, in the uh, pollinator foodscape. This was actually three weeks later, it just exploded. We had huge warm temperatures and now it was time for the butterflies. But the children, it was so crazy because when I first came here, this was a very adult garden and there weren't a lot of children. There weren't a lot of things for the kids to do. When we opened up this butterfly exhibit, let me just say the kids poured in and our admission increased 250%. We called it the butterfly effect. And in 2017, we were awarded the Cobb Travel and Tourism for Spot On Award for uh, uh, new event of that year. So I was really proud of that. And this year, uh, or last year rather, we doubled the size. So typically we had, in just the one little house, we had 250 butterflies, but now we were able to have 750 native butterflies flying around. So where do our butterflies come from? Well, they come from ethically sourced butterfly forms. And yes, there is such a thing, but let me just say they're not all ethical. Um, there were some that shipped butterflies unsecured and half of them, most of them were dead. It, it, was, it was like riding in a bus going over a cliff and, the, and there was nothing to hold you inside. Um, so I found this company and they're out of uh, uh, Florida and they come shipped in these uh, little boxes and they have, uh, they're packed in dry ice to keep them in a state of torpor, which is a state of hibernation. So they're caught and they're put in these cellophane envelopes and they're asleep. They don't eat for the first 24 hours that they're out of their, uh, their chrysalis. And so as soon as we open it and the light of the day hits them, they start immediately breeding or eating. They can't, I mean, it's like they just go crazy. Um, 
and we do order uh, also chrysalis. Um, so these are uh, monarch butterfly chrysalis that we have to hang up. It's one. It's a, the only one actually that has to be hung so that as the uh, butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, its wings can can unfold. Uh, because if you don't do that, then their wings can get damaged and then they'll never be able to fly. So uh, this is kind of cool. I want to show you our exhibit. Uh, if I can, oops, hold on. Let's see. Um, there we go. So this is just to give you a quick idea of what the butterfly exhibit looked like. Right now we only had about 500 butterflies in it at this time. We were getting another shipment in on that Friday. Um, but it was just, it was probably one of the best things I've ever been involved with. Because I'd never seen a butterfly egg before. I'd never seen half the caterpillars. Um, but it was like being in a James Cameron, you know, that Avatar movie. It was like all these fairies flying around and it was just, oh my God. It was just incredible. And their wings, when nobody was around, sounded like snowfall. There were so many butterflies in there. It was really spectacular. But I have to say, we have a real drug epidemic in this country when it comes to our lawns. So let's talk a little bit about the journey to the perfect lawn and how we got there. So in the old days, this was the typical front yard. I mean, they grew your own, veg you grew your own vegetables. You had everything out in the front yard. And then it was early in the 18th century that it became very, you know, they, to show off that you didn't need to grow your own food out front, that you could have vast swaths of lawn. Um, and this became the status symbol. And now it's led us to this, which now we're obsessed. Americans are obsessed with these lawns. We're spending thousands of dollars on chemicals just to keep a green lawn, which to me is like a vast desert, a green desert with no life in it whatsoever. And let me just say, chemicals don't discriminate. They kill everything, it doesn't matter. So the typical suburban landscape only has about 20 to 30% of native plant species. And I think we really, if we're gonna change the American landscape, we really have to get uh, homeowners associations involved and really kind of move away because to me that landscape of all those homes in that it looks like a cancer um, to me. And then of course we're hearing about how we're losing all of our birds um, and the decline in all the bird populations. This happens to be a wood thrush and wood thrush eat insects and here we're destroying all their insects and their habitat. They're, so we're destroying their food source and their habitat. Um, we are a wood thrush um, habitat. We're listed as such, and I heard it two years ago, but I will tell you, I've not heard it in the last two years. So that's kind of disturbing to me. Um, so for me, I want to make weeds fashionable again. I'm sorry, I think that lawn is spectacular. Dandelions, when people ask me what my favorite flower is, I tell them it's, well, it's not a hydrangeas. <laughs> um, it's a dandelion. I love the way they smell. I love everything about them. And they're the number one food source in the early spring for bees. So I think we need to rethink the American landscape. And if I get preachy or get crazy, forgive me. But I just want us to be able to eat our lawns because most weeds are delicious. And we're gonna talk about a few that are growing in your lawns right now if you don't have chemicals or you know, pesticides, whatever. So this is purslane, and we have it growing here in the garden. We all have this as a weed. Let me just say, it's so high in omega-3s and fatty acids that it's actually higher than salmon. And if you bite into it, it has this rich texture. You can feel it on your tongue. So the next time you're out in your garden and you see purslane, Take a bite, I'm telling you, it's delicious. Plantain, this is a weed we see everywhere, but it's one of the food sources for uh, a caterpillar, uh, a little moth that travels around. So this is an important food source. The seed pods are edible. They taste really nutty. And the, uh, the leaves, when they're younger, taste just like spinach. And chickweed, which is coming up everywhere right now. So, I mean, why not? what better way to get back at your enemy, the weed, than to eat it? Um, so chickweed is completely edible. And I will tell you, I had a, I had a brunch back before COVID. Everything's BC before COVID. Um, that, uh, and all my girlfriends came over and I made this beautiful salad. I had dandelions in it, I had violets in it and chickweed and, you know, dandelions. 
And my girlfriends are like, God, this sounds really good. What is, where'd you get this mix? I'm like, my lawn, you're eating my grass, you're eating my lawn. And they couldn't believe it. So, um, but anyway, chickweed is just, it's packed in vitamin C and vitamin B. I mean, everything that you want. But the most versatile vegetable you could possibly grow in your garden is the dandelion. And yes, I said vegetable because it is a vegetable. Every part of this plant you can eat and make a fantastic wine from actually. Um, so again, this is an important plant. Um, and I, I, if you were to walk out on our lawn right now, you would see it's blooming with the lamium purple and yellow right now. It, it's so beautiful. So again, as I said, dandelions are one of the first food sources for the bees. And this is an Italian bee because I am a beekeeper. We have bees here. I have, uh, I'm fixing to have four hives because we're going to split them today, but they're really tall hives. Um, but again, it's because we don't have chemicals here. And the dandelion is such an important food source because of all these little nectaries and pollen sources. Look how many are in that. So this is, it's an important plant. Here's, here I am working one of our hives and there's one of my sweet little bee hinds. Um, this is actually on a salix uh, pussy willow, which is another important um, food source for bees early in the winter. But you know, the Italian bee is not our native bee. And I do have to let you know that we do have several species of native bees. In Georgia, we have 532 roughly species of bees. And in North Carolina, you guys have about 500 native species, but across the country, we have 4,000 species of native bees. Believe it or not, yeah. So it's not just the honeybee uh, that needs help, it's all of our native bees. So how do you attract these native bees to your property? Well, you could build an Airbnb or do what I did and just take a log that I stripped the bark of and drilled holes in it and I put a little pretty you know, roof on it. But these are the ground dwelling bees. And let me just say, these are some of the sweetest bees ever because they're, they don't have honey to uh, protect. So they're very docile at sweat bees even. Um, so when I was, I tried to get a film of it today because they're, they're starting to emerge with these warmer temperatures. But last year they were swarming and I never got stung because they're, they're very, you know, there's, like I said, there's no honey for them to, um, to protect. So what can you do as a homeowner? Well, you can leave some wild areas of your lawn. Well, maybe not quite this bad, but I'm talking about even the simplest of a wood pile or leaves because there are so many species of pollinators and insects that are important for birds that live in the leaf litter. And if you look at the, in the fall, people are like bagging up their leaves, they're burning their leaves. And all I can think about is, oh my gosh, how many animals are being killed or destroyed because they're removing, you know, half their chrysalis. So fireflies spend two years of their life as a larva in the leaf litter. And if you remove that, then you're removing uh, the fireflies. So you, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there's been a real decline in the firefly. So <clears throat> we're spraying for mosquitoes, we're getting rid of the leaf litter. It's, I can't stress that enough to leave the leaf litter in at least some, leave some areas of your garden wild. This happens to be the luna moth uh, chrysalis or a cocoon, and she wraps her cocoon up in a leaf. And so how many luna moths have you gotten rid of? And her food source for her caterpillar is the sweet gum tree, which a lot of people hate, but it's such an important tree in the landscape for birds and um, for insects. And this is the, the luna moth, which again is one of those species that lives longer as a larva or caterpillar in the ground than it ever does as a butterfly. And most butterflies or moths, believe it or not, only live two weeks, um, except for the monarch butterfly. They live about six months, uh, but also the, uh, there's another, there's two other uh, butterflies that migrate and that's the zebra long wing, which I don't know if you guys have up there but also the cloudless sulfur that comes through. Um, so a lot of these plant species that we think of as weeds are important food sources for these, um, these insects. And again, as a food source for them is a food source for birds. Um, 
So what can you do again as a, as a homeowner? Well, let's include more native plants. As I said, most landscapes only have, I bet you not even 20% of native species in their yard. So include native plant species, but you have to be cautious of cultivars. And here's why. I found this out the hard way. I went to a plant auction um, and bought a, um, a passion flower vine, or I bid on a passion flower vine, and it ended up costing me $125, but it was a good cause. Because uh, I thought it was so pretty, and I was going to bring it back and let my caterpillars of the Gulf Fritillary eat it. Let me just say, they don't like it. They like our native passion flower vine because it's softer in texture and it's easier for the caterpillars to eat. So, not all cultivars of native plants are attractive to pollinators. Uh, you want to avoid hybrid species and hybrid varieties because they tend to breed things out of them that the insects actually like. Um, so always choose cultivars that are most you know similar to the species in flower color, in size, and shape. And then when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever it is you go, try to get plants that have not been treated with a systemic insecticide within the last year. It takes a year for that to come out of the plant. Um, and so we again found out the hard way with um, <clears throat> some of our caterpillars, uh, which we had gotten in some parsley that had been treated and um, it was not very pleasant and all the caterpillars died. So again, you wanna diversify the bloom time. Here, this shows you an ideal of early, early spring through summer into fall. Camellias right now saved my bees this year. This was a really good bloom season for the camellia and they were all over them. So camellias are actually um, great for pollen for the, uh, for the bees. And then color matters. So bees tend to be attracted to purples, yellows, and whites. And then bees have difficulty distinguishing red from green, believe it or not. So we, we did an experiment. I had an intern from uh, one of the high schools around here. And we set up four jars. Uh, one we painted blue, one was yellow, one was white, and one was clear. And the jar that was blue, always, we filled it with sugar water and put holes in it so the bees could uh, get the sugar water. But the blue one, always emptied out first. So blue, bees really like blue. And then red and orange flowers attract more hummingbirds and butterflies. Also plant in masses. And why is this important? Well, you know how it is on Saturday afternoon and you're running around trying to do all your uh, shopping and you know, you like your bread from this store, but you know, this store has the better eggs or better produce. So you're running around wasting a lot of energy and a lot of gas. If you plant in masses, you're saving those insects time and energy from just going hopping from flower to flower instead of having to fly so far from flower to flower. And then plant plants to support the whole life cycle of the insect or butterfly. For instance, everybody knows Asclepia or milkweed. Um, and again, this was another interesting thing. So they find that the tropical milkweed is very attractive to monarch butterflies, but they're telling people not to plant the tropical milkweed because it stays up and blooming so long, it doesn't force the butterfly to leave and migrate. And then there's another rule of thought that these farm-raised monarchs don't have the DNA to travel to Mexico. That's not in their, their memory bank to travel to Mexico. So they find that they're just hanging around. But I did want to point out that she is laying an egg on the underside of that uh, milkweed. And that's what a butterfly egg looks like. So, you know, we'll, in the old days, people would see eggs all over their plants and then they'd spray them or they'd squish them. Well, you're killing an important insect, quite possibly, not knowing what you're uh, killing. So it's important to plant for the whole life cycle. Because if you don't, then you're not going to get to have these ridiculously cute caterpillars. Um, I mean, seriously, that thing is just, it's, they're one of my all-time favorite caterpillars. So does anybody, and sadly, there's the butterfly, but you guys have a state butterfly. Um, and your state butterfly is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And their number one food source is the tulip poplar, a tree that most people, I, for me, it's one of my favorites. 
It's also one of the first nectar sources for bees early in the spring as well. But there's uh, the caterpillar uh, of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. This is their number one food source. And also another weed tree that people can't stand is the black cherry. And this is, I can't tell you enough how important this tree is uh, for, for birds and for butterflies. So again, this is, uh, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail eats this as well. Um, it's a huge nectar source for all sorts of pollinators. Um, this is, it provides an, I mean, important sugar source. It's so high in sugar, but it also produces these berries that the birds absolutely love and need. And here are the eggs. This is actually on our uh, black cherry that we have in our butterfly exhibit. And so these are the eggs of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And then in the butterfly exhibit, as I said, you saw the whole life cycle because we provided a nectar source for the adults and we had a food source for their caterpillars. So people that had never seen a caterpillar or an egg, a butterfly egg before, were just thrilled uh, with them. And this is just, I just love caterpillars. So cat uh, butterflies are very host specific. Um, and this is the black swallowtail. Now black swallowtail, like everything in the carrot family, which is like parsley, um, fennel, they love fennel. Um, so these are the caterpillars of the black Easter, I mean, uh, the black swallowtail. So again, they're very, very host specific. This is the Gulf fritillary. This is one of my all time favorite butterflies. And this is passion flower vine. Now, I know it has a tendency to take over and can like run rampant, but I used to grow it in my uh, fence in Shambly, Georgia, where I used to live. And it, it was taking over the whole garden, but by the end of the summer, it was gone. So this butterfly keeps this plant in check. And if we get rid of the butterfly, then, you know, it just, it runs rampant, but this was such a great, uh, I love this plant. It's like one of my favorite plants and it's the most intricate flower you'll possibly ever see. But this is her little egg and you can see the caterpillar is uh, inside the egg, she's orange. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. Just, it looks scary, it looks thorny, but it's not. It's one of the, the sweetest little caterpillars ever. So let's talk a little bit about how to attract hummers to your garden because they're an important pollinator too and they're gonna be coming through now. In fact, usually by the time the azaleas bloom here, that's when they start coming. So I'll be putting mine out probably in a couple of weeks, my, my feeder, but plants are just as equally as important for them. And these are some of my top favorite plants for hummers. So trumpet creeper, I know it can be invasive, but it's a huge uh, nectar source for them. Uh, bee balm, is important, Trump, uh, Lanistera sempervirens. Cardinal flower is one of the number one plants to attract them. They like that red or even lobelia, the, uh, the blue, uh, the, the blue, I can't think of it. John, you know what I'm talking about. Um, spotted jewelweed, red columbine, uh, Indian pink is very important. Red buckeye, oh my gosh, our red buckeye here was covered in uh, hummingbirds uh, last year, so it's, if you can find a red buckeye, it's in our plant sale. Um, I definitely get a red buckeye. Um, and then uh, again, Monarda, anything that has a nectar source, they're gonna wanna go for. Um, we also have uh, a butter uh, hummingbird banding event in September where we actually capture uh, hummingbirds and ban them. We have one of the few people in the country that's licensed to capture them and then we ban them and uh, record their weight. So you, you guys have all heard about the spraying for mosquitoes and all that. I really hope that you guys don't do that because of this plant. So if you have trouble with mosquitoes, I highly recommend you plant Calicarpa Americana. They're doing studies now uh, that they think that this will be more effective at keeping mosquitoes away than DEET. Now, the problem with this plant is that its oils are they're not very stable. And so we have them all over the gardens here. And literally, if there's a mosquito, it will find me. And But all I have to do is put one or two leaves in my pocket and they stay away. I'm not kidding. I cannot stress how effective this plant is, except for that you have to constantly be picking leaves because the leaves don't last very long. But this is very, very, if you want to keep mosquitoes away, plant this in your garden. 
So if you want more pollinators in your landscape, then leave it be. Leave some leaves in your garden. Stop using chemicals. You have to, we have to, we have to get off the easy track and simply stop using chemicals and leave small areas of our garden wild. Because I'm sorry, this simply is just not sustainable. I mean, that, uh, it just makes my skin crawl because I can't even think about how toxic that is. Not to mention there are no natives in there. Um, so yeah. So Pollinator Week is coming up. It's June 21st through the 27th. And if you guys want more information or need anything else, go to pollinator.org. They are a wealth um, of information. And um, I just, we work with them constantly. And so, um, yeah, it's a huge organization because let's face it, if your garden isn't being eaten, you're just not doing it right. And I wanna go back to the rose garden because I will tell you, we do, um, we do have problems with fungus. I'm sorry, roses don't wanna grow here in the South. They wanna live in Oregon where they have the rose parade and all that, and it's drier. So we do use a solution of baking soda, water, uh, you put a couple drops of dishwashing liquid as a uh, to make it adhere to the leaves, but the salt in the baking soda actually kills the fungus that lives on those leaves. So we get a big backpack sprayer, and in the middle of the humid, when it's really humid and we have a real problem with it, um, then we'll just go through and hose everybody down. Um, we also use rotten milk to keep the deer at bay, um, but I also bought these little solar things that emit a high pitched squeak. Um, and those actually work to deter the deer as well. But, uh, but you know, and then there's some things that roses, you just can't fight um, and they are gonna lose their leaves and they are gonna look pretty crappy at the end of the summer. And I just think our tolerance level needs to change as, as, as a homeowner. And I think uh, if we stop seeing weeds as a bad thing and maybe change the name, get a new marketing person for the weed, that I think, I think we'll all live healthier and we'll all live better. Um, I, I know I talk really fast and I probably should have added more slides. Um, but if anybody has any questions, I'd love to take them if, if you guys have any. Um, I know one person, Lisa, asked about moss. Moss. Um, you know, they're trying to encourage more, more moss in their yard. Do you know of anything that relates moss with pollinators? Or you know, the only thing I can say about moss is that it creates a moist environment for the larva of like the lightning bug. Um, they like a very moist environment to live in and they need that humidity. And I think uh, moss would provide that. I know in Japan, moss gardens are a huge uh, important uh, garden for them. And they literally wear socks on their moss lawns and then keep it weeded um, to keep other you know plants out of it. But yeah, I think it provides a habitat, absolutely. Um, someone was asking about how you, what you do about Japanese beetles. Haha, <laughs> so yes, we have Japanese beetles, but you know what? I put up two bluebird houses in on either side of our rose garden area. And last year we hardly had any um, Japanese beetle. Now, I don't know whether that was because we had more birds or, you know, uh, people were spraying in the uh, in neighborhoods outside of us because uh, we do have a large neighborhood behind us that I know sprays for mosquitoes and things like that. But we really didn't have an issue. If they were to get, you know, bad, then simply I don't believe in those traps. I think they actually attract them. So I we usually get buckets of hot water because I want them. If I'm going to kill anything, I want it to die, you know, quick. And so we get hot water, and then you put a little bit of uh, dishwashing liquid in there to make it so that they can drop easily into the water. Because if you don't, they'll float. Um, but that's what we do. And no so chemicals. You're, you were using spoiled milk for deer. Oh, oh yeah, spoiled milk. So. Um, we don't cry over spo spoiled milk over here, let me just say. But milk, uh, if you spray it on the roses or hydrangeas, which I need to do that. So the deer uh, have found my hydrangea collection. And uh, so we spray rotten milk and it smells bad to us, it smells bad to them. So um, we do spray it, but of course, like anything, uh, if it rains, you have to, to add more. 
Um, one of the other things we do for weeds around here, we, we use that corn gluten. Once we weed, we put that down. Uh, for cracks and walkways, especially in the crevice garden, we use horticultural vinegar. Uh, and then there's also a product at Lowe's. It's a, a citrus-based weed killer that's uh, actually we've had really good success with. But one of my favorite tools to use to get weeds out of the sidewalk, a blowtorch. We have a horticultural blowtorch. Let me just say, I, I will say that during dr times of drought, I do have somebody follow me around with a hose just in case. Um, but yes, a horticultural blow blowtorch has become my new best friend and it's fun to use. Um, someone was asking about controlling English ivy if you've had any. Um, I mean, I, I hate to say we, we, you know, I use Roundup right when it's emerging, uh, but cutting it back a lot so That's, it weakens it. That is key. So if you if you do have to use, okay, let's back up. So native plant people that go out on these rescues are big proponents of Roundup because it kills all that. It kills the ivy. It kills the privet. They don't have a lot of time to spend in these areas for, to bring back that native habitat. So they do use Roundup, but they do it in a way that it, it's not so willy nilly. You know, they're not killing everything. But English ivy, it's so important to know that if you've ever felt English ivy, it's very waxy. And that waxiness keeps the, uh, the chemical from killing it. So what John said, cut it back, let that new growth emerge. It's not got that protective coating and then spray. I'm not opposed to using it. I, I just, you know, I have volunteers that'll come pull it. <laughs> um. Someone was asking, I don't know, we use, we actually use liquid fence in the garden for the deer. Liquid fence is good too. Um, yeah, I didn't know if that had any, there's also a product called, um, it's actually started by a woman in Raleigh, I think, out of her home kitchen. And the brand name is I Must Garden. And she's oh. got, um, you know, deer deterrent, um, squirrel deterrent, or, you know, a couple different things, but that's organic. And I know my sister uses that outside of Charlotte and it's been, uh, quite effective. Try that. I must garden. Yeah. Um, cool. And it's always good, you know, I, I've heard that use this, you know, like liquid fence for a couple of years and then switch to a different product because that's why we're they, using the milk right now because they got used to the liquid fence. Oh, I meant to take a picture. We also have a fake coyote. Um, he is plastic and he looks real and it, um, yeah, he's he's actually taken me by surprise a couple times, and I remember putting him there. But he actually worked for a minute. The problem is you have to constantly move him around like he's real, and then you buy uh, fake or not fake, but coyote urine uh, on it. And then also one of the uh, people that maintains our collection, the Rose Garden, now swears by human urine, and I'm like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to know what you're doing over there, but. She says it works. Also, uh, human hair. So if you go to a salon and get uh, hair, that's supposed to work. I haven't tried that, but um, but yeah. Um, someone was asking about. Someone was asking. You know, the, talking about public gardens. Um, you know, we do uh, adopting best practices, and a lot of the gardens. You know, are the Million Pollinator Initiative. There's a lot of things going on within APGA that are um, definitely. You know leaning into best practices for the pollinators um, as well as pesticides. There's, you know, we have, I don't want to call them support groups, um, <laughs> but, you know, we probably need those in public gardens as well. But, um, you know, most public gardens really are trying to showcase the best practices. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the biggest missions for public gardens is education. So yes. uh, they're mentioning, you know, a, a place that's uh, across the street from us and they mow right up to the water's edge, which, oh. you know, and, and sometimes it takes time. It takes, you know, it, it takes a, a place like say Grayland to, to understand that that's important to the community that instead of mowing up, let's establish a natural barrier between if they've got lawn and, you know, Lawns, they have their roles in the garden, but um, someone was saying, you know, about uh, how to contain clover. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, it doesn't bother me. If it's green, I'm good. You know what? As long as it looks like grass from a distance, I'm good. But I would rather walk barefoot on a clover lawn than I ever would on some sprayed perfect lawn. 
You know, I mean, seriously, and clover is so important for the bees and it's edibles. All I have to do, if I get hungry, all I do is go walk around. <laughs> I dare. It's crazy. Um, but I, I really how... hope if you guys are in the Atlanta area that you guys will come see, you come visit us here because I think for a public garden to, to do what we're doing, um, and really, I will say, when I first came here five years ago, they looked at me like I had two heads when I said, I'm not using chemicals. They didn't think I could do it. They didn't think it could be done. Um, but we, we are doing it on 16 acres. And if we can do it on 16 acres, then the homeowner can do it on three quarters of an acre. Yeah. I, just, okay. I, I did like how you mentioned about the um, uh, American Beauty Berry, because I think that <laughs> that was, it was, it's one of these things that it was, I think an, it's a Native American, yep. um, you know, it's, it's in the origins of Native Americans using them as a, a deterrent. And then, you know, it's like, well, let's see if there's anything to this. And yes, it is. It is. And I, I'm telling you, we put it in our pockets because I don't like to put chemicals on myself. I don't like to use DEET. Um, oh, not, a, not that this is a shameless plug, but this is what I use on the dogs. Uh, and my cat. It's flea flicker tick kicker and it actually keeps mosquitoes away too, but it's uh, peppermint, lemongrass, healthy for you, healthy for them. So, I mean, I spray this in the summertime all the time if I don't, if I'm not around any calicarpa. So again, it's all about getting away from the toxic uh, chemicals, but beautyberry, sh it's showing so much promise if they can just get that oil to, um, you know, stick around a little bit longer. Yeah. And someone was asking about your ratio of baking soda to water for the spray. You... So if you have a gallon, it's usually um, a table or a gallon, I'm not a gallon, a spray bottle Ugh. about this size. I would put a teaspoon or a tablespoon of baking soda, fill it up with water, and then just a drop or two of um, dishwashing liquid so that it sticks to the plant when you spray it. Again, you'll have to uh, reapply after every rain, but um, it's very, very effective. Oh, great. And keeping powdery mildew um, down. Someone said that they heard that sod is now available with a clover blend. Oh, That's I saw that too. I saw that too. Yeah, I would love to. If you were to walk out on our lawn right now, like I said, the lamium is in bloom. The dandelions are in bloom. That lawn makes me so happy. So, yeah. And someone's asking, is flea, flea flicker? Oh, what I do with it? Oh, here we go. <laughs> So it's, I don't know if you guys can see, it's Flea Flicker Tick Kicker by Arc Naturals. I get it at Chewy, um, but I spray it on my dogs before I let them outside so that they don't bring any fleas inside. And let me just say, in the 10 years I've used this product, I've never had a flea problem. Um, but I also spray it on myself. It repels, you know, kills fleas, ticks, mosquitoes on contact. So. Oh, well, cool. I think we're, we're, Good. Uh, no more questions are coming in, but um, you know, definitely, you know, Lisa, you know, the invitation is always to come up our way, and we definitely need to come down and visit. Um, yes. You know, we. I really want to thank you for taking the time and and sharing this with our, with our, you know, garden uh, friends, and um, just to give everyone a heads up, the uh, cherries that we've installed are just starting to show a little bit of color. Um, turf will start going down tomorrow. Um, God, I, I feel like a hypocrite right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll go, I promise I'll go sprinkle some clover out there. Um, but you know, the garden really is starting to wake up here. So definitely come and stroll the gardens. The trillium are coming up in the woodlands. Um, I've seen the uh, trout lilies are emerging. So there's a lot to see out at Ronalda. Um, definitely get out in nature. Um, it definitely makes me smile, and I think it's 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 great for um, great to see spring really starting to show up now. Well, thank you for having me. I hope I didn't. I hope I wasn't too preachy. I hope. Uh, I hope nah. you enjoyed it. Nah. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank everyone. Um, we'll see you next week. I'm trying. I'm. I, I've got to admit, I I forget who's next week. Um, I'll have to pull up on the calendar, but. You know, every Tuesday we've got someone lined up. Um, you know, and remember the plant sale will be coming up at the end of April. Um, friends get early access, so 
it's important to become our friend of the gardens. Um, but with that being said, just uh, we look forward to seeing you in the gardens. Bye, thank guys. You, thank everyone. you.